Good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Some people may not be good morning, it might be good afternoon. So wherever you are uh, uh, in Europe or across the world, good morning. And thank you for joining uh, this webinar in a series of webinars that we've been doing to celebrate World Diabetes Day and also our overarching theme for this year, which is the centenary of insulin. Uh, so welcome everybody, uh, just, just on, on just some numbers and what we're going to be doing today. Uh, I'm just going to introduce you to an absolutely wonderful panel that we have here. And the theme for today is innovative financing for sustainable access to quality diabetes care in Central and Eastern Europe. And how far are we from universal healthcare coverage uh, and uh, looking at stopping the out-of-pocket expense, which is what universal health coverage is all about. Uh, on the centenary of insulin and access to care, which is our overarching theme for the whole, for the whole year this year, uh, about 61 million adults in, in Europe live with diabetes. It's forecast to increase to 66 million by 2030. People with diabetes require ongoing care and support to manage their condition and avoid complications. We all know that. But equitable access to treatment needs to be guaranteed to the most up-to-date evidence regarding the benefit of medicine and technologies, including newer alternatives. So today is about that equitable and sustainable access to quality di uh, diabetes care, and it is on Central and Eastern Europe. Um, I'm going to ask our wonderful panelists to introduce themselves to you. So uh, first of all, I'd like to call on Andrea. Andrea, please could you unmute yourself and put your camera on and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to join today. My name is Andrea Feigl. I'm the CEO of the Health Finance Institute. We are a nonprofit organization focusing on blended finance for chronic diseases based in Washington, D.C. On the, in the U.S., my background is I'm a health economist and um, have been working in global health and looking at financing for chronic diseases over the past almost 20 years now. Thank you so much for having me. Over. Thank, you, and thank you, Andrea. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Smilov. Saeed, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, webinar. I'm Professor Ismail. Uh, my background is my is my I'm endocrinologist, and uh, I was uh, uh, director of endocrinological center for 20 years. At present, I am chairing the department of endocrinology in the Tashkent Pediatric Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Said. Lovely to have you here. Said's an old friend, so it's very nice to have you here, Said. I'd like to invite Mr. Akanov from Kazakhstan to introduce himself. Um, thank you very much. Uh, please, I uh, want to uh, say my words of appreciation for inviting me to this uh, very impressive group of the experts. Um, so I'm an endocrinologist, uh, diabetologist. I'm the head of the uh, Center of Diabetes in Almaty. And also I'm president of Kazakh Society for Study of Diabetes. And uh, mo most activity, of our activity with ASD, Asian Association for Study of Diabetes with Professor Yutaka Sena. And also we work together with ESD, European Association for Study of Diabetes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rakhanov. So, so nice to have you here. Uh, Adrian, Pana, would you, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello everyone, I'm Adrian Pana. I'm a medical doctor by training. Um, uh, currently I'm working as a health policy expert, have an extensive background um, um, of uh, working with uh, different um, government organization like the Ministry of Health and the Health Insurance Fund in Romania. Um, in the last couple of years, I uh, shift to research myself and uh, I'm uh, conducting a lot of research on um, uh, chronic diseases. Diabetes is one of the uh, um, key teams. I'm, uh, I'm working with uh, different stakeholders in Romania. I'll be more than happy to share my experience regarding access to uh, diabetes care in, uh, in this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Pana. Very nice to have you here. Uh, I'd like to introduce Irina. Irina, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Nidia. I'm Irina Vlasenka from Ukraine. I hope you remember me. 
I, uh, I'm pharmacist. I'm also a patient with diabetes. And uh, as board member of IVF Europe, I was deeply involved in East European country. They are in my heart. And because I know a lot of problem in our country. Thank you so much. I just uh, save time. Thank you, Irina. Uh, and it's so delightful to have you here, Irina. Thank you so much for joining us. Finally, at last, Professor Lalic to introduce himself. Nebosa, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nebosa Lalic. I'm from Belgrade, Serbia, endocrinologist and diabetologist by training, internist as well, uh, in charge of the reference hospital for the country and president-elect of the IDF uh, Europe. Great, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Lalic. And Nebosa is such a lovely friend of ours and he uh, does so much for uh, the whole of IDF Europe. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lalic. So, um, so I'm going to invite uh, Nebosa to open this webinar with his opening remarks. We're going to move on to Irina, then Dr. Adrian Panna, then Andrea, and Dr. A Ms. Dr. Akinov after that, and uh, finally Saeed last but not least, and then Professor Lalic will close. We'll have a panel discussion and we'd like to leave some uh, time for panel discussion. So I'd really ask you all to have a lively discussion at the end. So over to you, Professor Lalic. Thank you very much. I'll try to share my slide. Oh, you will, you will, okay, fine, great. So. Could you put it to the slideshow? Okay. Uh, then, uh, as, as Niti just said, uh, uh, this is an introduction and uh, sort of defining over an overarching team of this symposium, but uh, more, even more than that, it is just, uh, uh, it is uh, try, trying to stimulate the discussion over very important problems of challenging uh, of the quality of diabetes care, but also of financing and central in, in, in Central and, and Eastern and Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the part of uh, our uh, uh, simple, a number of our symposia that with, by which we are celebrating the International World Diabetes Day. And uh, we are trying in fact to search for innovative financing in the circumstances of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, to, to really um, uh, see how far are we from the universal health coverage. Uh, 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 at this uh, particular centenary of insulin discovery, we are also, uh, however, still uh, uh, very much, uh, if not obsessed, but interested in uh, the topic of access, access to diabetes care because as it has been uh, already said uh, in Europe, some si more than 60 million adults uh, live with diabetes. Uh, people require ongoing care and support to manage their conditions. And we need really an equitable access to treatments. Uh, and if you look, uh, this is the, the map of uh, uh, the Europe. In fact, it's a map of the world, which is going to appear in Diabetes Atlas this year. And uh, you can you can see this this tiny tiny red uh, line uh, uh, that uh, that uh, tries to in fact not separate but focus to the right side the region about we are talking today and this region is a huge one but also on the right side of my slide you can see that uh, uh, the 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 level of the level of uh, um, of prevalence of diabetes, which is far from being satisfactory. So uh, the start, even started from that point of view, we can uh, find what, in what type of situation we are. And uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, regarding health expenditure for diabetes in uh, Diabetes Atlas of uh, 2019, it was already said among other figures, that we know that the lowest estimates are for Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Ukraine, the countries that are belonging to the region in which we are, uh, doesn't meaning that the others have uh, uh, any, an investment that is, uh, that is surprising. So uh, we, uh, in this area, we find 
uh, the countries in which the investment is rather rather low. Uh, may I have next slide? Th this is uh, these figures are small, uh, and uh, this is in fact more um, uh, more uh, exhaustive, more um, complete uh, 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 table with the uh, with the uh, in in the final column. You can see the figures in dollars uh, for each country. And you can see, for example, then in Bulgaria, you have more around two thousand uh, dollars per year. But uh, in uh, on the on the on the other hand, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, it was two hundred and thirty, uh, which is uh, a substantial difference. The same happens uh, for for the other part, for the second part of those uh, countries uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, the first look over this uh, situation is that, for example, in Tajikistan, it's 170 million invested per year. In contrast, um, for example, to other countries uh, in which uh, it exceeds thousands. May I have next slide? So we would like to uh, try to uh, figure out somehow and to pave the way to ensure equitable and sustainable access to quality to diabetes care uh, by uh, this symposium, at least to start this process. And it is time to rethink how care is financed. And uh, uh, especially in this region, especially, uh, let's say, to put uh, some agenda uh, until 2030 and that uh, can be based on the agenda that is already accepted and some targets of it uh, as our agenda for sustainable development uh, with target 34 and agenda for uh, and the same agenda target 38 may I have next one so this is the structure of the symposium in which we will have first uh, some general approaches of the uh, topic to the topic may I have next slide and in the second part we will have examples of impl implementation in eastern uh, east uh, in in eastern europe and uh, in some countries central asia and in the end i will try to to propose a sort of call for action thank you very much Thank you, Nebosa. Uh, really quick and uh, nicely said. So thank you. I'd like to now invite uh, Irina, uh, who's one of the vice presidents of IDF Global. She used to be on our board to give you a roll call of Eastern U European Diabetes Associations on World Diabetes Day. It's a short report. Irina, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Niti. Uh, I, first of all, today I speak on beha uh, behalf of some member association of East European country. Big thanks to President IDF Europe, uh, Dr. Niti Pool, for opportunity to tell about this. Our call, IDF East European Member Association on Diabetes Day, which was initiated uh, by Ukraine Diabetic Federation. Unfortunately, not every member association in this country could uh, participate due to busy day 14. And thank you, Niti, that you uh, was with us. I would like to remind that 40% of population of Europe live in East European country. This is a little bit definition, East European country, we think that it's like post-Soviet country as well. Um, the first meeting of the, the head of the diabetic organization of East European under the umbrella of IDEA board was 2003. Most, but not every, of the EEC country are part of the Commonwealth of Independent States and they have a main cooperation platform for the CIS parliamentarians. And last documents, which, uh, which was approved by CIS Economical Council in December 2020, as a program of cooperation between the member states of the CIS on the prevention and treatment of diabetes for the next period till 2025. And uh, Marina Shapulina, uh, who was uh, deeply involved in this process, uh, can see, uh, can uh, say it, uh, that we can see positive impact of diabetes care of uh, cis inter uh, parliamentary interaction during the last few years. And productive work, uh, one of these is agreement of the treatment of people with diabetes during COVID. Yes, with a big part of IDF, uh, IDF but if you look as great uh, explain 
Ni Boisha, Professor Larik, uh, about difference, but you see the situation in East uh, countries is strikingly uh, different and varies from country from country. And Ukrainian, Ukraine is uh, recognized as the poorest country of Europe. Yes, we have financial uh, problem underfunding, yes, but not the last problem waste and inefficiency in the healthcare system. This is slide from uh, New England Health Institute, but uh, uh, I'm sure that we have more problem that day. Uh, continue constantly and the challenges in access to insulin sometimes in, in same uh, some country. And uh, this are uh, my underline of uh, IDF Europe uh, leaders say, member associations say that uh, uh, about national diabetes program on the uh, in needed more than ever. Ruslan Zakoy from Kazakhstan. Rima Bazarbekova said that self-management schools have official status and funding. This is a good example uh, for, for us. And Rosa Sultanaliva from Kyrgyzstan uh, say that they most focus on training GP because not enough endocrinologists num number is not enough. And they not use BSMLR, only human and other insulin. Uh, Karina Tatsanyan from uh, Uzbekistan, a new achievement in Uzbekistan. All children under 18 years receive analog insulin. Valentina Chiletenka from Ukraine, Ukraine uh, says the data is very uh, everything. Uh, yeah, health is a perfect solution and uh, um, statistic and financial matter. And this is common problems for a member association EC country. Lack of statistic and very poor data quality. You can see this in Atlas. A lack of national diabetes plan. Not every country has uh, in the fair. Lack of diabetic, uh, diabetes education patient. Lack access to new technology, including digital and modern medicine, firstly insulin. Uh, Russian Federation and Republic of Kazakhstan have better uh, situation with devices. Lack of communication uh, uh, last time between association. And finally, uh, uh, we as European East country are together. We have common goals, many of the same problem, but uh, we have specific inherence uh, EC due to common beginning and the process of uh, statehood formation in our country. And uh, they apply to idea to hear them voice. Uh, cooperation with EC should stand up to high level on strong uh, partnership with Europe. Modern technology allow us to communicate in all the region. All together, everyone can achieve more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Irina, for being so quick and for bringing all of this uh, uh, over here. And uh, you know, hopefully, uh, at some point, we will be able to meet in person and to have the wonderful association meetings that we used to have in the past. So thank you so much for bringing all of this to our attention. I'm sure there'll be debate, debate on this as we go along. I'd like to invite Dr. Adrian Panna now, uh, who's going to be talking about the key, key principles and strategies supporting availability and affordability of core diabetes interventions and services. Uh, Dr. Adrian Panna, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to uh, present um, um, my experience um, uh, regarding uh, access to diabetes care to uh, entire population in this part of the world. And uh, as uh, I heard from uh, the previous speaker, we're sharing a lot of problems. Uh, but uh, we might see that um, uh, we're gonna have uh, also the same solution uh, to, uh, to implement. Uh, if we can, if we, can go further, please. So to me, the current problems that uh, relies on the, uh, our societies relating to uh, diabetes, it's the increased number of uh, new cases, the insufficient and not sustainable investment in preventive activities, uh, suboptimal involvement of primary care team in risk assessment, diagnostic and treatment of at risk for diabetes or diabetic patients. The um, curative care is centered around diabetologists or endocrinologists and not so much on the network of care. There is a fragmented care pathway for diabetic pa patients and we have an insufficient active involvement of the patients in disease management. 
Also high rate of complication and disability adjusted life years despite availability of several therapies and medical devices throughout the region. Possible, oops, possible cause, causes, one behind, sorry. Here. So as possible causes, I, uh, I try to identify some of the uh, system problems. And uh, I consider that one of it is the fact that our system, we share the same past and we still have a kind of perpetual transition of health system in the region. Um, our prioritization and allocation of resources, it's still a bit subjective, not very objectivized and transparent. Um, we have a concentration of uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes mellitus care in big cities and around clinical hospitals. We suffer of chronic of the either underfinancing and insufficient spending of health resources. We lack planning capacity. Decentralization, it's not yet finished. Um, HTA, it's in the beginning, it's an emerging process and we still need to, uh, to do a lot in order to, uh, uh, to use it properly. We have a low capacity for monitoring and implementing clinical protocols and care pathways. Also, we have a problem with the way we registered data related to uh, care pathways for diabetes and also uh, malfunctions of diabetes registries in, in the region. Further, please, next one. What we face right now, we have an increased life expectancy. So um, even though the uh, deaths related to diabetes, it might decrease, we will gonna face long number of years with disability. Multimorbidity, it's another problem we are facing. And uh, of course, with multimorbidity, we have higher cost. We have different expectancies regarding outcomes from different stakeholders, a steady increase of cost of health technologies, an integration of fast speed innovation in our health system, the networks of care that uh, uh, help us to use uh, and the services and to provide care differently, the concept of added value of care services, and also we have the emerging threats as we know. What might be the uh, potential, potential solutions that uh, we can have it at our hand? Uh, I identified four of it and I'll, I'll talk a bit of each one. Uh, first, to redesign the healthcare system, including the strengthening of primary care for diabetic patients, health promotion and prevention policies, patient-centered integrated care and expanding availability of medicines and medical devices. Let's go with the first. Next slide. So, when we are redesigning our health systems, I think we need to objectivize and prioritize diabetes as a major public health problem due to the burden of disease, the cost and the consequences related to this problem. Then we have to ensure sustainable financing for the entire diabetes mellitus care pathway with a mixed type of payments for the entire process of care. We can pay for added value using performance indicators, benchmarking, bonuses for keeping citizens healthy, uh, diabetic patients without or with less complication that we have right now. So we can do more in um, adding value on the care that we provide right now. Then we have to invest in health promotion and preventative interventions especially health literacy. And we need to uh, redesign the way we provide uh, diabetic care 
at primary care level. So we need to delegate and involve primary care teams in early detection, diagnosing and management of diabetes mellitus patients by increasing involvement of community nurses, allied health professionals and family doctors in management of diabetic patients. We need to keep as much as possible diabetic patients out of the hospital by expanding home care, self-monitoring, outpatient, day hospital services. We need to reorganize the diabetic network of care around the patients, involving navigators, care managers, essential specialists beside the diabetologist, and ensure interoperability of operation and easy access. Also, last but not the least, we need to involve actively diabetic patient in decision choices, providing feedback and reporting outcomes. Next one, please. Investing in um, health promotion and uh, prevention, it's really important because we need strong commitment of the government for sustainable investing in health promotion and prevention of diseases, knowing that results of preventative activities or health promotion are not happening in four years time, which is usually a political cycle, a regular political cycle. As an example, we can, uh, I can tell you that uh, in Romania, we pass a law, we enacted already a law on prevention and early detection of diabetes. And we're still discussing on taxation of unhealthy products. Then we need to do more in health in all policy approach and the intersectoral collaboration with other sectors, education, agriculture, um, industry, also uh, transportation, uh, physical activity, those kind of areas are very much important in order to keep the patient healthy and also the citizen out of problems. We need to invest more in healthy start in life by tailoring programs for learning for um, young children. Uh, we used to have uh, several external projects on doing this. So best practice is already here. We just need to embed this into our usual work. We need to provide health education throughout life to expand the ways of health promotion, prevention and self-monitoring digital apps that we, we have it at our hand and to redefine the role of primary care team in provision of preventative service community level. Next one, please. Center care for diabetic patients. So um, we need to provide care pathways for diabetic patients in order for them to know what are the steps they can go through in order to have better outcomes. Those care pathways need to be functional. So we need, in order to have them functional, we need interoperability of information for the entire network, wide usage of electronic health records and diabetic re diabetes registry, availability of health specialists, allied health care professionals, inclusive via telemedicine or um, uh, other type of uh, techniques that we can use right now. Easy access, especially to outpatient and post-acute hospital services. Also medicine management and treatment reconciliation, knowing that diabetic patients tend to have multimorbidity. Next one, please. The last one. It's related to innovation and health technologies. As I said before, fast innovation, it's uh, fast speed innovation is coming through our systems and we need to, to react in a way. So how we can do best, we need to expand adequate use of health technology assessment in order to um, uh, assess properly health technologies besides pharmaceuticals like medical devices. We need to take into consideration other important aspects along with clinical benefits and cost effectiveness, also budget impact, such as severity of disease, different vulnerable groups that need more type of services. The way, uh, if, the, if the system is ready to, uh, to provide that technology and monitor that technology, those kind of things are really important 
when we decide to uh, embed the new technology in our system. We need to expand the use of clinical trials to promote the collection analysis and reporting real world evidence, to develop and expand share risk manage entry agreements for medical devices and pharmaceuticals, and pilot effective interventions to address preponderantly risk to develop diabetes or diabetes complication. Uh, my last slide, uh, it is one of my thoughts. So I, I think that today it's the right time to fight the diabetic pandemics. So not only COVID, but diabetes can be also fought today. And today is the right, the right time to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. We will pick up some of your points uh, in the discussion, I hope. Uh, I'd now like to invite Andrea. Andrea, over to you for your bit of your presentation. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me. And it's an absolute pleasure to join. I'm going to share my screen from my end. So um, just bear with me for a moment. Yeah, thank you. One more moment. So. Let me go full screen mode. All right, so you might ask yourselves, what is what is a, a CEO of a US-based organization doing on an Eastern European webinar? And uh, um, I'm actually Austrian, but, and um, based on Dr. Lalic's presentation, Austria was actually included in the set of countries, though probably not officially. So I'm probably, I, I'm gonna be an honorary um, um, Euro Eastern European representative this morning. So, um, or in morning in my time. So um, very quickly before I go into the presentation, I um, um, wanted to talk a little bit about the Health Finance Institute. So. We, um, our core mission is to catalyze new or innovative investment strategies um, for chronic disease uh, programs um, when it comes to adherence, access, and prevention. And um, it, most of our projects are indeed focused on type, type 2 diabetes as well as type 1 diabetes. Um, we are a relatively new organization. We were founded in 2019 um, and have formed partnerships with the organizations such as um, uh, WHO, um, JDRF, um, Life for a Child, um, also some pharmaceutical companies um, and, and several UN agencies as well. And at the premise of what we do is, um, and this is probably nothing new to you, at the, uh, at the core of what we do is that we believe that health and wealth go hand in hand. And this, this has been made very clear to us uh, or the world really uh, during the COVID pandemic. And it's also especially true for, type, for diabetes where um, you know, investment in primary care and prevention in the quality of life um, um, has direct implications, not just on health, but also on um, direct and indirect costs faced by the healthcare system and the economy at large. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about um, innovative finance strategies and what innovative finance is and what we you know, why, why are we talking about this period? And so um, as the, the world shifted to the sustainable development goal agenda, um, for with the goals for 2030, there was a report by the World Bank that called from a billion to a trillion dollar agenda, but it also called for the mobilization of private capital that is both philanthropic and, and, and private sector uh, capital towards um, a, the various development goals. And, and that can includes- Can I just stop you for a second? We can't yes. see you advancing your slides. Can you-, you can't we can't see you advancing them. We're just seeing black drop down menus yeah. on your screen and we, we're not seeing your slides advance. Oh no. Could you Let me try this? Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Now, Is that? Yes, now we can okay. see. Thank you. Okay, so, so that was my second slide about health and wealth going together. And then um, I was just going here to the SDG agenda. And so, there was a, um, and also in a World Health Organization report, there was a, what was a figure that was mentioned that about 20% of the funding for healthcare systems should also come from um, either blended finance or um, from a public private sector mix. But there has been very little sort of 
delineation of how and what that would indeed be possible because blended finance has been quite um, common in um, sectors such as infrastructure and technology, but very little um, investments through blended finance have been made in health. In fact, um, we have uh, we have studied the last decade of in, uh, investments in blended finance, and only about four to six percent of all blended finance programs have focused on health, and only a small sliver, a small like single digit percentage of that percentage was actually focused on chronic disease projects. So we're really in a somewhat uncharted territory now. Um, this is um, uh, an adjusted figure from uh, uh, that USAID released in terms of like what what is innovative finance and what is blended finance. So, on the left, you have sort of traditional development assistance, so that is both financial as well as technical assistance to countries, and on the very right, you have commercial investing. So, commercial investing is everything um, you know, basically a return high return seeking investments, and um, innovative finance. Is, is sits somewhere in the middle, which includes conditional funding, catalytic funding, impact investing, and social, socially responsible investing. And I think for, for health sector growth um, in particular, the, the notion of blended finance, so conditional funding and catalytic funding is, 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 is of highest relevance. And conditional funding is often like, I give you money if, right? I pay for your success or I pay with interest or higher interest back to investors, and that can be public and private sector investors, if you reach a success of a program. And catalytic funding can often be <clears throat> funding that says, okay, we're gonna invest in this sort of infrastructure, we can invest in this program, and there were also de-risk other sources, forms of investments, both private, philanthropic, and, 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 and uh, private. So, um, so um, to put this in a different um, in a different concept, when we then um, hone in on on these blended finance instruments, so just um, you know we're basically taking looking at these two um, conditional and catalytic financing, and then we go one layer deeper. So what what is that? So it um, basically the purpose of it is is to de-risk, to leverage, and to get some returns, both in terms of health as well as direct capital returns. And the ones that we have seen in the health space in terms of the instruments are advanced market commitments, catalytic first loss capital, risk guarantee, impact bonds, microinsurance, as well as others. And um, uh, in terms of what that can entail or what what that what the what what the hope is with that is that there is an increase in innovations, um, that that there's investment in cost effectiveness of prevention. A cost effective preventive policies um, that is a decrease in out of pocket expenditures and it also can mean to redesign primary um, healthcare towards more integrative and um, data uh, data focused systems so there's a lot of resonance with some of the presentations that we've heard earlier around the need for better data quality quality which is absolutely essential for blended finance to work um, and then also um, HDA and M&E components that factor in very strongly for setting up successful blended finance projects. Um, and so um, to this perhaps re restates what I've mentioned earlier, which is that um, the, 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 the focus is really on impact and the impact where um, investments, co the impact of these investments um, results both in health, social, economic, and um, environmental progress. Um, we've also, um, at the Health Finance Institute, we've also studied um, the determinants for blended finance by looking at a decade of blended finance interventions. And the key factors for success is that you have robust healthcare systems, um, that there's a strong either technical assistance that accompanies the blended finance product, or you have actually um, you know, a very strong technical know-how on the ground. Um, in terms of the transaction size, so when you set up something like, you know, pay for success models or guarantees or others, the transaction cost, which means, you know, getting all the partners together, um, setting up an M&E system, ensuring that the data quality is high enough, bringing in an intermediary and an M&E partner is sort of a fixed cost. So what that also means is you, you don't want to have a too small project because then 
then you can have often an, an, a scenario where you have 30, 40% of the entire project being just the transaction fees. So you have to really be able to justify um, and, and, and have a very good reason to, um, um, to, to, um, to set up a smaller, a smaller scale project per se. And then the other important factor is sort of a stable political and economic environment. That is often the reason we have that here is when we look at sort of like really low income countries, often sub-Saharan African countries where, you know, you have a currency that's really unstable, like you have an inflation rate of 22 or 42 percent a year. And then, um, you know, investing in that particular environment becomes very risky. At the same time, um, blended so social impact bonds, for example, work much better if you have an actual stable outcome payer and a predefined in, 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 that's predefined in the system that you're working in. I know I'm taking quite a bit of time, but um, I've done a little bit of research with my colleagues um, in terms of, um, uh, so basically, uh, so which Eastern European countries actually have any innovative finance projects and what we could find um, that there's actually, Russia has five impact bonds, three of which are in the health sector. Um, so you have um, uh, in, an impact bond on increasing the number of citizens involved in assessing their health status. The other one is on residential care for disabled people, and the other one is on su supporting independent living for disabled people as well. Um, uh, another, and then I'm going to talk about two projects that we are involved in, um, and we're just getting started. We have recently um, signed an agreement with the Danish Red Cross that, that is um, it has been rolling out a di type 2 diabetes access program for vulnerable populations, vulnerable elderly in Armenia. And um, the way we work as a health finance institute is we're basically looking at the economic impact, the health and the economic impact of this program, and whether that could justify, um, with a strong M and E system, um, basically a larger scale investment in a, a pay for success program in the form of a of a social impact bond. Um, so right now the agreement is to to understand the health and economic impact. But then also do some uh, conduct some forecasting that if it, this was scaled, if there is um, both health as well as economic efficiencies um, with and and that could be shaped into a pay for success model to then have a further proof point for integrating. So the ultimate success of a blended finance project is that it then becomes sustainably integrated either in a large scale insurance system or in the um, in 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 the health um, you know. In, in the health insurance at large in, in the country, the national health system at large. Another project that we're involved in, and I know this is not in Eastern Europe, but I just I just came back from a trip to Mexico and um, I was I was quite devastated at a personal level about how devastating the access to insulin there is, particularly for those suffering or living people living with type one diabetes. So um, because of recent changes in, in distribution policy and in healthcare policy at the federal level, there's basically a stock out in the national insurance, in the national system for insulin for the last two months of the year. And so um, persons living with type one diabetes that rely on a national insurance, they literally don't know where to get their insulin, the right kind of insulin for the next day. And so this, you know, after hundred years of discovering insulin, that, that is really, that's a travesty. So. What we're doing there is we're working with a uh, state government to help them set up an integrated care center that would also not just allow them access to insulin, but also measurement devices that are not covered by the national insurance. And I, um, yeah, so anyway, so this is, and then we hope to basically have a proof point to then integrate that into the larger healthcare systems by working both with the public and the private sector of innovative, for, with innovative financing mechanisms. Um, and then, and last but not least, I know that, and I will share those slides, I know that um, Social Finance Israel was going to um, speak, and HFI has actually studied their um, social impact bonds on, on type 2 diabetes um, to a great extent, because I think it's one of the biggest and most successful social impact bonds that exist. Um, and what they what they have done is basically um, overlaid a pay for success model on an existing insurance system. So everyone already has universal health coverage, more or less, um, in Israel, and they have a really, really good data system. So data and a predefined payer. So who pays for the care in the end is absolutely important for that. So um, and they basically um, a, you know put certain metrics um, around um, impact um, health 
impact and achievement and overlaid that onto the system in form of a social impact bond. And then they have actually um, um, increased, you know, adherence and actually um, um, uh, improved on a lot of the health indicators and the care seeking indicators, which in turn then um, impacted, um, had, had, a, had a positive fiscal impact. Um, and um, this example also, um, and I don't know if this is publicly available, has also prompted organizations such as Swiss Re, which are an insurer to, you know, basically um, fund an, an internal impact bond, a social impact bond for diabetes, um, because the savings are just so great, both from a health perspective, as well as from a financial perspective, if you shift care to early access and prevention in a strong primary care system like the numbers just make sense um but there's you know there's an upfront cost to setting up these these systems so not there you know it, it uh, not not a lot of them are done because most of them are still be, uh, bespoke um so i know i've taken up a lot of your time i hope i haven't bored you too much um but the idea is that blended finance is a way of financing healthcare for access adherence and prevention that both benefits the person with the disease, it benefits the healthcare system, but it also might have benefic benefits to um, those who invest um, in these um, financial, um, you know, financial um, um, agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Fascinating, fascinating talk. Uh, the social impact bonds is one of my kind of big areas of interest uh, across the world, because I do universal healthcare for KPMG across the world. So it's really interesting to see that real life examples that you brought to life. Uh, we'll pick this up in some of our discussion, but it's been fascinating. No, you haven't taken too much time. It's absolutely Great. spot on. Your, disc your uh, presentation was spot on. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to now, without any delay, invite uh, Mr. Akanov from the Ministry of Health in Kazakhstan to give his views on the review of the recent healthcare reforms in Kazakhstan. And uh, I've had something a little bit to do with them, so I'm really pleased to invite you, Mr. Dr. Akanov. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, this presentation about our research burden of diabetes in the Republic of Kazakhstan. Next, please. So the situation with diabetes is the same as the world. We have uh, you know, increasing the number of the patients with diabetes year by year. And so in the red figure, you can see uh, 2012 2013 we start active uh, make the uh, more actively the screening for diabetes and the next uh, red figures showed the okay the next the, the second one it showed that was the situation when we starting national uh, insurance uh, healthcare uh, national insurance healthcare yeah next please so that's uh same situation uh, now we have, this is a research for Professor Namcho. So the same situation now, the number increasing because uh, how to say the patient is more easier to join to this program, insurance program, national insurance program. And they prefer, prefer to use our healthcare system as more as possible. Okay, next, please. Next. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the patients with diabetes have a very pure, the, uh, blood glucose blood uh, level unfortunately only 35 percent only 35 percent of the our patients have a, a subcompensation or compensation of the diabetes in fact next please so unfortunately uh, from due to complication we have uh, seven fifteen years this is our data now we have the situation with uh, diabetes and that's 41 percent have uh, the retinopathy especially type one the, we have 42 patients all patients of dialysis is a diabetes patients and increasing year by year and we have around around 60 uh, around uh, 600 major amputation uh, it's very bad uh, situation if we can compare with uh, japan for example for 127 million they have also seen 600 major amputation in Kazakhstan. Uh, our total population is around 90 million. So there is a show to us that we have not good pro have no good program for preventive diabetic food syndrome. Next, please. So the staffing and the technologies, of course, we have deficiency is not enough. The 0 0.4 for 10,000 population, uh, 2019. Unfortunately, it's not good, and we can say that we should prepare uh, more endocrinologists, especially for regional 
healthcare system. Yeah, please next. The same uh, the situations shows to us that uh, the more, more than fifty percent of the uh, doctors uh, have around thirty patients per day. <clears throat> it means that only eight minutes for for patients in the for duty is uh, absolutely abnormal. Is we should to do something, and this is the reason that we have deficiency because uh, the, uh, the doctors don't want to work very hard. Next, please. So uh, amputation, for example, in Kazakhstan is one of the problem. Diabetic foot syndrome, look, is a major amputation around uh, 600. And uh, totally with the part of the leg, we have uh, 12,000. It's uh, absolutely abnormal. And we should do something. I mean, uh, this, I mean, it, this uh, quality, this number of the amputation, we showed to our Ministry of Health. And then they start to do something in this area that's starting the new program with the vascular surgeons also. Thank you. Next. So treatment. Treatment are totally free for the patients and we have all groups of the drugs. You can see everything as GLT2 inhibitors, uh, GPP-1, GPP-4 inhibitors. And of course we have everything. And uh, uh, we should to say to the, our uh, patients, please use it. But the patients, patients prefer to still using sulfonyl urea and metformin. And also we ask the doctors, the new generation of the doctors, please, you should explain to the patients about the situation, but situation still same. Look, GPP-1 agonist still less than 2.5% of the patients using. Next, please. So this is a reason that the Republic in Kazakhstan from uh, evolution from insulin resistance to insulin deficiency is only eight years. For example, in the Europe countries or Asian countries, uh, Asian Pacific countries, it takes around 13 years. Uh, look, this is a typical situation and uh, no comments. I think that every, doc every clinical doctor, they understand in this situation. Next, please. So we're trying to calculate how much uh, we spend money for the diabetes is the first step in the, our program, the Kazakh program, I will, I will say later. So this is a design, it's absolutely easy as we have the group for disability pen, pension. We should do, uh, calculate the GDP. We're calculating about uh, days and uh, how much the working days and how much it cost and how, how we lost for this. And it's absolutely easy. I think that's maybe all countries have same design for research, for this research, this type of research. Next, please. So, uh, cost association associated with uh, management here is the type two, type one diabetes. Look, we're using even the hyperglycemia, yeah, and uh, keta, ketoacidosis, retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy. Look, we uh, have the frequency in population and expenses is around seven point eight million of US dollar. So of course, it's uh, only type one. Please next. For type two situation is dramatically changing. Yeah? Of course, because we should understand the shared ischemic heart disease and the uh, hypertension, myocardial infarction, and the health fair, and of course, same, uh, uh, same complication with the type one. And please, we make the calculate that it's around uh, half billion dollar uh, per year in Kazakhstan. It's, uh, it's a huge, big, so I think that is a big, a big problem for the healthcare system, especially for the budget of the Minister of Finance, of course. Next, please. Uh, of course, we calculate the non-medical cost, and uh, it's also same like a lot of the research in the world. There's a non-medical cost that we calculate based on the number of the patients, including the study, disability group, so non-medical cost uh, we calculated. So it's around uh, twenty. It's around uh, two hundred forty million of US dollars. It's also a very big problem. Is the GDP losses, and of course uh, now we're working with ASD, and ASD also shocked of these uh, losses in the Kazakh budget. Next, please. <clears throat> also, we calculated. Uh, uh, Temporary disability due to diabetes mellitus, yeah? It's, a, it's, a, it's not a unique situation because these patients, a lot of the disability due to uh, temporary disability due to diabetes, yeah? 300, 300 uh, I think 300 million dollars, yeah, please. It's uh, absolutely, absolutely abnormal. Next, please. 
So as a final conclusion, the total burden for the, the diabetes in Kazakhstan is around $1 billion per year. And look, uh, we make the search for diabetes atlas and also they said that predicts that it's around $1 billion and it's, IDF is absolutely right, correct. It's around $1 billion per year. And of course, uh, for Kazakhstan money is around uh, four, 436 billion national tenge, it's huge big money. And also, of course, we should do work with uh, WHO-IDF and the ASD, ESD. So we're working together. We have a lot of the research, so we have consultation. And also, this is the first step. The next step will be national program. We should to think about the national program based on these uh, GDP losses. Also, this money, the burden of the diabetes in Kazakhstan. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhnov, for your uh, intervention. I'm going to quickly, swiftly move us on because we're going to swiftly run out of time. Saeed, I'd like to invite you to give your perspective, um, and then we will attempt to have a panel discussion. I don't think we'll have much time left for that, but uh, Saeed, over to you. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, we have the prevalence of diabetes mellitus in Uzbekistan. We, uh, we have registered patients, more than 276,000 patients, all, but uh, inclu including type 1, type 1 diabetes, uh, more than 18,000, type 2 diabetes, more, more than 276,000 patients, and adults with uh, Oh, type 1 diabetes, uh, 15,000 patients, and children more than 2,000, and uh, adolescents, 841 patients. Next slide. slide. You know, we have uh, 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 the, uh, the following structure of endocrine care in the Re Republic of Uzbekistan. On the center, we, we can say that Republican Center of Endocrinology, which regulates the, uh, the uh, diabetes care in the whole in the whole Uzbekistan, including regional endocrine dispensaries. We have the new dispensaries in all regions with new buildings which are equipped with modern equipment, organized in, in the interdistrict departments of endocrinology. It allows patients from remote areas to receive local care and network of uh, district polyclinics and the endocrinologist offices. This structure allows to ensure the ability, the availability of endocrine care throughout the, the Uzbekistan. Next slide. Next please. All patients with type one diabetes who are registered of, at the clinic, at the places of residence receive human insulin at the expense of, state, of the state. All children with type 1 diabetes receive analog, analog insulin at the expense of the state. And all patients with diabetes um, type, one, type 2 acquire tablets of hyperglycemic drugs and insulin by themselves. Next. New technologies, pumps. Uh, 100 you know, children were provided with pumps and consumables for a year. At the moment, consumables are purchased by themselves. Then, next slide. Insulin pump availability. On average, the cost of pumps in Uzbekistan is $2,500, American dollars. And consumables cost approximately 165 American dollars. We have uh, diabetes school next. Uh, Next slide. Um, each next. There are 29 diabetes schools in the Republic. These schools are represented in all regions of the country. They, they have trained nurses, uh, which were taught and uh, educated by uh, Professor Mayor. Um, re, uh, rational nutrition for patients is also discussed. Next. This uh, uh, our uh, production 
which we uh, have printed uh, for patients and uh, doctors. Next slide. We have uh, an order of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan on approval of national program for the improvement of endocrinological service to the population of the Republic uh, in the years of 2019 and 2021. Next. The road uh, for healthcare reforms. Uh, a goal for that has been set in Uzbekistan to reform healthcare within seven years by 2025. The focus for transformation is to optimize approaches to human health, ensure coverage, accessibility, and quality of care within the fr framework of comp comprehensive measures, the development of health care court, laws on transplantation, reproductive health, public-private partnerships on compulsory health care insurance, as well as on health, healthy lifestyle is also envisaged. Ahead of the development of private health care, public-private partnerships, and medical tourism, the creation of favorable conditions and improvement of competitive environment for the widespread in attraction of investments in the healthcare sector. Next slide. In some countries, healthcare reforms taken, um, have taken many years. In France, for instance, 60 years. In the Republic of Korea, 40 years. In Turkey, it has taken 10 years. And Uzbekistan, our goal has been set for reforms uh, within seven years by 2025. Next slide. Today, the roadmap has been developed for the introduction of compulsory health insurance. It has three stages. The first stage, the pilot project is um, uh, started by June of this year in the district, in all districts of Sardaria region. And uh, the second stage, in uh, 2023, uh, uh, which includes six other regions, the Republic of Karakalpakstan, uh, Tashkent City, Samarkand City, Nawai City, Surkhandaria, and Fergana regions. And the third stage is, co is coverage of, um, by the 2025, all other regions. Next slide. The represented draft strategy for financing healthcare of the Republic of Uzbekistan by 2025 indicates the expected results in the introduction of compulsory healthcare insurance. You know, it, um, uh, um, first of all, it will help uh, for citizens increasing you know, of the degree of accessibility and quality of medical care a clear separation of a single state guaranteed volume of medical care from services involving payments by patients, the formation of healthcare system focused on the timely and high quality satisfaction of citizens' needs in medical services, improved health and uh, increased life expectancy, reducing the level of informal payments for medical service. Next slide. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Said. That was a quick run through of what the problems are and what Uzbekistan uh, is, is doing this. So um, I'm going to quickly open this up for a panel discussion. So I'd like you uh, panelists, all everyone who's spoken to please switch their cameras on. Thank you, Nibosa, for switching yours on. So Irina, Adrian, Andrea, Mr. Ak Dr. Akaroff, uh, could you all switch your cameras on, please? Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to just moderate a quick panel discussion. I think there are some questions that have come in on the chat, but I'm going to kick you off uh, and I'm going to kick off with Andrea. So Andrea, you had some, uh, and Nabosa has got his hand up. Just give me two minutes, Nabosa. I'm just going to moderate the discussion if you'd like to say something. Of course, something. of course. I'll, of I'll course. Bring you in. So one question to Andrea, and you talked of blended financing and you talked about you know, social impact bonds. Uh, but you said on the on the on the blended financing, a lot of this 
is being done on infrastructure projects rather than on health. And a very small sliver of that goes to healthcare. So I'd like, really like to understand from you. And then you talked about, you know, in your final slides, you talked about the funding of primary care and redesigning uh, on integrated care funding. So why is it that infra seems to get blended financing? And I've seen this across the world in the 44 countries I've worked in. Uh, and healthcare and health services, the actual service delivery bit of it. You try and get funding, blended finance for a hospital and infrastructure, you'll get it. But you know the other side of a PPP model with blended financing for services doesn't seem to be uh, quite there. So just a question on that for you. Thank you so much for this question. So. Um... I think one of the reasons we see this, um, we see this is that um, in the social sector, um, combining um, combining investments and 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 financial returns has been is has been traditionally, you know, uh, just 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 not perceived as such that you know you invest in education and in 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 um, in health for for financial return versus in infrastructure it's the link between who pays and who benefits it's much closer right you build a road you increase trade the economy benefits and it's it's clearer in in health sometimes the chain of causality from like the treatment as well as the economic outcome and then who pay is is further and then it's not often clear whether the people who pay are the you know people or, or the companies who pay are the ones that benefit. So because it is more complicated, it's not necessarily so natural. And we as you know um, academics and researchers and 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 implementers have to basically make the case in a much more stronger fashion. So, but I mean, I think the pandemic especially has shown us that that, that health and wealth go together. Um. And then now I forgot your second question. I'm so sorry. Was, no, no problem at all. The second one was around, you know, the funding of primary care and, and as being the kind of bedrock. And I know that I'm a primary care doctor. So I, I will say that the funding of primary care through social impact financing. Again, you know, governments have funded this through, you know, in the UK, it's uh, it's capitation based funding, different things. Kasai has just spoken about. Uh, funding through an insurance system, but most insurers will not fund primary care. And in fact, a lot of big insurers and health insurers actually exclude outpatient care as being on, in the claims process, you know, private insurers. So why do you see that? And that was my question around. So primary care doesn't seem to receive that kind of funding. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't really have a good answer to that because I think the investment case is really, really clear, especially when you look at extreme cases. I'm going to say, like, for example, um, if you look at the um, and, and there, there is actually um, I think the investment case is very, very clear. But I think it might also have to do that. It might also have to do with sort of a, you know, like expensive equipments that can be leased and that, that can, can generate specific returns. Yeah. But if you have a closed system where the same patient stays in the same system or the same person who is a healthcare seeking individual stays in the same system, the investment case is clear. And I think we just have to shout this a little, you know, make, make it make, make it a lot more apparent. Over. That's correct. Correct. Thank you, Andrea. And clearly it clearly shows that. Maccabi and clearly to both show that in, in Israel. So that's a, it's, if every, everybody hasn't seen that case study, we've also, KPMG have also published it on our website as well. It's a, it's a very big case study to, to look at innovative financing, not just innovative financing, but closing that loop on integrated care. So it's a really good one to watch out for. Nibosa, you want to say something? Yes, I will be, I try to be very short. Regarding this Austria dropping into Eastern Europe, I just had, um, had a, lot of, a lot of time invested in drawing this line between Czech Republic and Austria. Uh, again, it's not the line that separates the line that unites, but uh, uh, on the other hand, it, it, it is technical, of course, if, if it happens. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there were so many initiatives from Austria to us, uh, to the region, especially the Balkan region, in improvement of diabetes care so that even if we you you're in there, you should be proud of it. <laughs> that's my that's my first absolutely uh, proud. Would never deny it. Absolutely that, proud. That, that's my first remark. And the, the second one is uh, all of us have mentioned the types of centers, uh, centers of the primary care, secondary care. Uh, uh, could that be in future the places that can communicate 
with, for example, IDF Europe more intensively that uh, in, in, the, in the process of reforming the, 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 the diabetes care in all particular countries, and especially the, the, the centers at the level of primary care, because in some of the countries, the system is that uh, the, the state finances the primary care, basically. For, uh, with us, for example, primary care is a sort of gatekeeper. And uh, you, should, you cannot uh, see the patient uh, out, uh, at uh, the secondary or tertiary care if you're not referred. So this is uh, the, 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 these centers, especially the primary care, but also elsewhere, might be the, the, the places that can communicate with, uh, for example, IDF Europe, but also other associations and companies uh, for the reform of the healthcare system. Always true. And uh, Nebosa, I'd say that because I'm a primary care doctor and have campaigned for this for many, many years. Barbara Starfield's work is very clear on this. If anybody hasn't read it, please read it. And the person-centered medical home principles apply. And I think, Adrian, you referred to that. I think Dr. Akanoff referred to that. And Saeed, you referred to that. Saeed, I'd just like to follow up with a question to you because it's fresh in my head, uh, is around the health insurance reform in Uzbekistan. And you talked about you know, the phased approach, which is a lovely approach to take rather than doing a big bang. So in terms of diabetes care, are, are you looking at full insurance cover for diabetes care with the state? And if so, is it being bundled with, and there's a question here uh, about lifestyle change and that should more bundled payment systems be going into this? So is that bundle being paid for? Is prevention also being paid for? And are all the medicines and devices covered? I think uh, all the medicine will be covered. Now, uh, the project has started in June of this year and uh, the data is being digitalized and the educational process is going on now. And the, the nurses and doctors should be educated in this process. And then it will be done uh, phase by phase. Um, and and uh, it will at least uh, will come to the middle in the 2025. Thank you, Saeed. So uh, any comment from you, Adrian, on what you've heard on impact bonds, on social financing? Uh, and you know, you gave us a very, uh, you, you defined the problem very clearly, and then you gave us some solutions. Uh, and you know, uh, those were great. You, you talked about integrated care, you talked about primary care. So any final comments from you on the funding and the financial systems that need to follow this and value-based care that I hear around the world. I think that, uh, as I said in my slides, uh, funding sustainably preventative activities and health promotion, it's very political. So you need consensus in order to, uh, to invest for a long period in that. Bundle payment could be one option. Uh, in Romania, um, we have a lot of um, intervention for diabetic patients that have been paid and are still uh, paid. Also technologies are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, integrated in, uh, in care of the patients, but it's still a long road to be done in order to have better outcomes in terms of uh, closely monitoring uh, complication of diabetes, how and when and uh, where to uh, provide those type of interventions. And also I would love to see more involvement of patients into decision-making of their care. Correct. So uh, quickly, que just one, one minute answer from you, Irina. There's a question from Moldova here on the role of the pharmacist in delivering diabetes care and does that reduce the cost of care? Very yeah. Thank you so much for this question, because I, I, I want to add this information because I listen about primary care, but I think it's very important involved uh, uh, pharmacists in this in prevention, in management uh, and help to doctor assist. And this many, many studies show that the pharma, pharmacist interaction reduce cost of, uh, cost of treatment. And this is, I want to change, it's not cost. It investment. I agree with you. Uh, and a final comment from you, Dr. Akanov, and then I'll hand over to Nebosa to wrap up. Any final comments from you? 
So uh, I totally agree in Kazakhstan, of course, we have a lot of experience how to organize the primary health care area, you know, Almaty declaration, Astana declaration, yes. we know, we know every, everything. Unfortunately, the problem is, uh, is only one, yeah, uh, is a self, um, uh, is a pro the problem with the patients. Uh, they need to take the uh, more uh, knowledges from us, but, but sometimes we have a direct problem with the patients. They don't want to do what we recommend. This is a problem. And I absolutely agree with Professor Ismailov. We have also around 1,000 uh, schools for, for the patients in every primary health care organization. But uh, now in Kazakhstan, next year we start the program, national program. We will based, we will based on this uh, same situation in Uzbekistan. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, so it could be a problem, what could be an opportunity for change. So involving the patient, as uh, Adrian said, in their care and how we see that panning out on value-based care and the experience of patients on value-based care would be a really good one to measure. So th I thank the panelists for your involvement. Neposa, over to you for closing remarks and call for action. Thank you very much. If I can have a slide, I will focus your attention to this um... Uh, part of the concept note uh, that uh, you might uh, have received uh, before this uh, this meeting, uh, we, uh, we we try to put some uh, uh, put some let's say uh, roadmap uh, about uh, what should be the most important things for concentrate in future uh, when we are calling for action, and uh, that is uh, prevention that has been shown to delay the onset of type 2 diabetes and the complication uh, that should be prioritized, uh, that healthcare system should be redesigned with the focus on investment in the primary care accompanied with innovative functional strategies, that new function, function financial sorry, mechanisms should be introduced to decrease out-of-pocket expenses ensure equitable and affordable, which is important, access to quality of care for people living with diabetes and increased investment in innovation. There should be more transparency and improved country competence. And uh, people living with diabetes uh, should be adequately represented in order to, um, uh, to, to timely rep represent their needs uh, when uh, co-designing uh, systems that work and are involved uh, in um, health technology assessment processes. So, of course, this is not uh, the, the, the final document. This might, uh, any of your suggestions would be highly welcome and that we can go together uh, with uh, in future, like uh, with this call of action. With that, if Niti, you would like to add anything else, no, thank you, Nabosa. That was very well said, as usual, very concise and very well said. Thank you, Nabosa. Uh, we'd like to close this webinar now and thank you. I thank the participants for all their participation. You've been amazing, amazing, amazing participants and amazing panelists. We hope to keep in touch with you. Do keep in touch with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>